we're back. We're live. This is Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. This is the military in Hawaii. And I want to make a statement before we get on with our show with General David Brantley. And that is that why do we care about the military uh, in Hawaii? Uh, it's not only because historically we have been inextricably intertwined with the military since roughly 1850, a long time ago, and not only because they, they form a, a substantial part of our economy, not only that, it's not only because they, they defend us and they, they protect us from whatever might come, um, but it's because they are a culture point in Hawaii. They are part of our sociology. They're, they're part of our community. And sometimes I think we forget that. So I think it's really worth talking to them on a regular basis and seeing you know, what, what they are doing here, what they are, what they are engaging in here, how they are participating with our community, um, you know, and, and finding out about what contributions they make. And that's why I want to talk to David Bramlett. Thank you, David, for coming on. Well, thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about how you got to be here. Um, you were uh, David oh. Bramlett, four-star general. That's pretty serious. And, <laughs> and you seem like an ordinary human being. It's so nice to find a, a four-star general who is... Yeah, that's, that's, so you have a, a really a lot to talk about. And I, I would like to talk about how you got to be a four-star general. It isn't that easy. Not everybody can do that. No, it's, it's uh, you, you work hard. It's like any profession, any, anything that you put your mind to, you work as hard as you can. And a lot of great people, and this is gonna sound like a cliche, but it's the cliches are cliches because they're true. And in my case, lots of wonderful people I worked with. I was very fortunate. And a luck along the way, as you know, in, in any profession to, to reach the, the senior levels like I did, it was an element of luck, too. It's different, isn't it? Uh, it, it really is different. When you get up in the stars that way, uh, each, each star, if you will, um, takes you to a whole new level that's different than the last star. And by the time you get to be four star, you're seeing at the 100,000 foot level, you're seeing issues, you're seeing you know, global process the way you know a one star or two star would not speak. Am I, am I right about that? No, that's, that's very true. And and the the military system it builds on each successive layer. Hopefully, your assignments will give you that broader perspective, because each job you get is a job you've never had before. Rarely do you get the same job twice, and so you have to learn the new job and broaden your horizons. And then if things work, then you get selected to move up. And as you said, you get to a certain level, then your your vision, if you will, your perspective has to broaden to the strategic level. That's one thing about the service uh, that, I, that I noticed in my time in the service, which I, I don't think people fully appreciate, is that it's a learning experience. Every time you change your duty station, every time you take on additional rank, every time you go to a school, uh, every time you deal with a different crowd, so to speak, you're you're learning, and uh, it's it's a it's a it's an ongoing educational experience. And I, you know, in in Hawaii, people, as in many other places in the country and the world, um, they they start out in a given position, they stay there, uh, they go through the the seasons, and the um, marriages and births and what have you, and uh, they retire, and it's all very straight line. And there isn't a lot of learning. A lot of people do not learn after they graduate the you know, required schooling in that community. And I think there's a huge difference between that kind of life and career and the life and career that anybody in the military has. I mean, I remember how many courses they sent me to when I was in the service. Yeah. And uh, I learned, and, and I'm sure that's the same today. And I'm sure it's the same when you're a senior officer. Um, you know, the government wants you to be Akamai about everything. So they're going to send you to school all the time. It's a different life, isn't it? No, it is. And, and many people probably don't appreciate just what you said about the educational component. You learn professional uh, topics and you go to things like the War College, which actually be, really should be called a national security college. But you go to schools throughout. But the services, and particularly the Army, my service, takes a great premium on civilian education to broaden your perspective. It's one thing to, in my case, 
as a young second lieutenant out of West Point. I wore a uniform for most of my life. But two years of that time, the Army sent me to Duke University in civilian clothes uh, to study comparative, actually English literature, to teach at West Point. But now that was my experience. But most of my contemporaries did a year or two uh, at a, a civilian university to broaden their perspective, continue learning and education. And not something I think uh, many in the civilian world appreciate, the broad educational background that most senior officers have. Yeah, and it isn't limited to, uh, you know, war and uh, military things. It could be anything. As you say, it could be English literature. And, and um, if, you, if you just take a scan of, um, of the officer cadre now, um, you find that everybody has a graduate degree. Yeah. And, and that isn't by coincidence. It's because the, uh, the military says, we like this, and this is going to look good on your fitness report, and uh, we're going to you know, pay your tuition, whatever it is, to encourage you to do that. We want well-rounded individuals. It's, it's not so much that you can get in a trench. We want you to understand the world as it is, because you have diplomatic obligations. You have management obligations, and we need you to be fully educated. Am I right? No, you've, you've, you've nailed it. That's exactly what the thinking is. And you look at here in Hawaii, the senior officers that are still wearing the uniform, look at their duties and responsibilities for the nation in the region, uh, in the whole Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific region. Uh, these, uh, these senior officers at, at uh, PACOM, Indo PACOM, I should say, and Pack fleet. All all of these folks are are diplomat warriors, and, and probably diplomat becomes first for exactly what you said. Uh, you you're saying it better than I am. I'm surprised I'm here. <laughs> so one of the things we've been talking about is is uh, it, it's very interesting. It dwells on me more and more. Is that we here in Hawaii we have a lot of retired general officers like you. Um, and you choose to stay here, and I, I really want to inquire about what your considerations were, but bottom line is um, we have a tremendous resource in you. And, and right across the street, we have a tremendous resource in retired foreign service uh, you know, officials. So there are hundreds of them here, and, they, and they've all had brilliant careers. They participated in you know, the American influence, mostly in Asia, but maybe elsewhere too. Um, it's, a, it's a resource that Hawaii doesn't fully recognize, but who I should recognize because uh, it's something that can be converted to um, beneficial relationships, including business relationships uh, between Hawaii and Asia. And I know, you know, there's tension these days and COVID creates you know, obstacles and all that. Bottom line, though, is that this is a workforce that could, that could connect Hawaii as opposed to other places, as opposed to the national country, the whole country. We have special resources that could help our state in the form of people like you and retired uh, foreign service officers. Have, have you ever gotten together in a room with all these people and, and shared that notion? Uh, no, not in, in the forum you described, but, but we meet each other as, as, uh, as volunteers. Now, some uh, are in the corporate world and do exactly what you said, uh, representing the country and and particular corporate corporation they work with. But we, we meet each other at, at back to Military uh, Affairs Council, the MAC. Uh, there's a collection of retired senior officers there and business leaders and so on. Pacific Asian Affairs Council, again, they're uh, diplomats and uh, foreign service officers, if you will. Uh, Pacific Forum. Uh, so they're fora, if you will, where we do get together, see each other, compare notes, and look for opportunities where we can help this a particular organization reach out if it's in our area, our wheelhouse, if you will, to assist. So there's there's for uh, in, in the state for us to do Asia Pacific Center, I should also mention. So there are there are just four examples where we all get together um, and compare notes and see where we can help. What about business? I mean some of the some of the retired flags are out there in Asia, they have a Rolodex as long as your arm. Uh, and it's not just, uh, you know, government or even military, it's uh, business. It's, um, you know, various officials of one level or another where they can pick up the phone and find a familiar person on the other, on the other side and, and represent American companies and make deals. 
and they could represent Hawaiian companies and make deals. Exactly. Is, there, is there a possibility there? Oh, no, that goes on. No, we, what you described is, is uh, and I, I'm not going to get into names, but uh, there, that's a perfectly acceptable, honorable way to, to leverage your experience for uh, the, the local region you're in, the countries, uh, and your, your, your personal, your context. There's nothing wrong with that. And that does go on, and they represent uh, businesses here. Well, it's something you know that I've been thinking about, and maybe maybe there's a future in trying to diversify our economy and reconnect with Asia. You know, there's been talk uh, ever since uh, APEC was it five or six years ago, yeah, um, where we could make some hay out of our resources, and I think we still need to do that while we have those resources. But why did you why did you decide after a, a long career in the army? Why did you decide to stay here? Was it the weather? <laughs> that certainly that, that certainly was an advantage. Um, I, my, my background, my, my dad was in the Navy, so we bounced around. I had no roots, and my late wife uh, was an Army brat, and she we had no roots. Um, I chose Hawaii as my first assignment. Um, I took me 20-something years to get back here, but when I came back as a brigadier, uh, when my late wife and I came back, we, be, we began to sense this was where we felt at home. Uh, the weather was, was nice, but the, really what was nice are the people we met. And we both said, gosh, this is like home. But you'll remember uh, the, the, uh, the cost of living, the housing market has ebbed and flowed, uh, more flow than ebb. Uh, and it just wasn't practical for us. And um, but we always dreamed of this being our home. And about the time I retired in 98, uh, the um, cost of housing dropped at that time, as you may recall. And we had the chance we changed our all our retirement plans overnight and came out, came out here uh, on the, near the end of my career to to speak at um, the National Reunion of the Nisei Veterans. It was the opening of the, uh, uh, comfort, the uh, conference center. And we looked around and found an, a neat home on the North Shore and changed all our retirement plans and we came home. And that's where I'm here. I lost my, my late wife uh, several years ago to cancer and um, I remarried. And this is home for me, for us. And you and you have actually invested a lot of time, energy, and, and heart into the community. You have been very diligent in finding a place where you could be useful in this community. Can you talk about it? That was a conscious decision. As I mentioned, my, my late wife and I were vagabonds. And even in, in my service, I was moving every two or three years and never really got a chance to be a part of my community. And because of the good fortune that fell to my lot, we decided uh, when we retired that we would do community service and get really learn about our community, be a part of our community, try to be productive, volunteer where we could. And so we came here, lived on the North Shore for uh, the better part of 15 years. and. Um, and then again, there's no shortage of volunteer activities if you're willing to do it. And so that was our principal focus was to be a part of our community. First time for either of us to do that. And it's, it was, it's been wonderful. What kinds of organizations have you touched? Uh, they're, they're varied. Some are what you would expect, somebody like a USO, Armed Services YMCA, the Hawaii Army Museum Society, and international affairs and, and Things of Latin Asia, Pacific Asian Affairs Council, the MAC, um, educational. I, I did, uh, we mentioned at the break, I always wanted to teach adults. So I decided, and uh, with HPU allowed me to teach one course a semester on, uh, uh, yes, uh, you could guess the American way of war, which was a history of the how and why uh, the US chooses to use force of arms. Um, and, um, um, nine years as a regent at um, Chaminade University, 
I did volunteer work, volunteer work at Waimea Valley. I volunteer with the Mokwakini Heiau Children's Day and um, an assorted other volunteer activities. Yeah, I think we've heard just about enough, General. <laughs> <laughs> I said there's no shortage if you're willing to volunteer. You're, you're really motivated. So what, what's on so the a lot of that's history. Not a lot of that's history, but that's over, over the, the years since I retired. Well, but, um, history, but I'm sure this, uh, this, you have aspirations of others um, to expand and to in, in discover and investigate uh, other, other possibilities for you. I mean, what, what, what interests you now going forward? I, I, some of the activities I still evolve with, and, and this is, um, there's no cheating father time. And so you, you begin to pick and choose and some things I, I've, uh, I'm still involved in. And it, I like that. And hopefully with, if we get the COVID under, uh, under control, we'll be able to travel a little bit more. I, I do like to travel on occasion. And well, I'm sure you traveled plenty when you were at Camp Smith. I did. Well, not, not as much at Camp Smith. It was, I was the homebody. My, my bosses did the traveling. I was the, uh, the stay at home husband, if you will. I have, I'm looking at uh, your bio here. <clears throat> Deputy Commander in Chief of Chief of Staff of the Pacific Command uh, for oh, three, four years at least. Huh? Yeah, well, it was a little over two years. So, um, that must have been an experience. When I, mean, I was in the service in the Coast Guard, uh, I, got, I got up to Camp Smith on a once in a while basis, and it was the it was the pinnacle. I mean, it, it it surveyed the entire Pacific. How many tens of millions of miles of uh, of jurisdiction? It was quite extraordinary up there. Yeah, no, there there were um, so many challenges. We we talked earlier about the the role of of senior officers, but not just the senior officers, certainly the, 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 the commander of Indo-Pacific Command would do and his senior folks would do tremendous work. But a lot of the majors and lieutenant colonels and lieutenant commanders and commanders and of all services, they would go out uh, for two, three weeks and coordinate with, with other nations. And each one of those men and women took our country's uh, legacy, they took our country's of virtues and values with them. And, and I can't tell you the impact they had over the two years I watched them go out and come back. And my job was to find out what they learned and just give a short debrief of what they did. And it was astounding what um, a Lieutenant Colonel or a full commander of the Navy could accomplish uh, in three or four weeks in another country. Enviable actually for a career like that. Yeah. It's, it's diplomatic. It's, it's more diplomatic than, than military. Uh, you know, when, when after the war, we weren't doing that sort of thing, but in, in our lifetimes, yours and mine, the American military has become much more diplomatic than it was. And uh, every, every officer is a, is a diplomat. I'm sure you saw that unfolding during your career. No, it, it, exactly right, because we realized the, the, how interconnected we are and how we, count on our friends and allies and to work with them and understand them culturally. And the services have, have created a whole field where you become an expert in another language culture and you become a, essentially a foreign service expert in uniform. The, the foreign service officers you spoke of, tremendously uh, valuable, but there's too few of them. And so even in the services, they're, they're developing experts for the regions to promote exactly what you said. So looking at it now, I mean, every time I meet a West Point graduate, a young West Point graduate, I'm always impressed with the, the breadth and the depth of his or her knowledge. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's the American dream. Uh, I think it has been for a long time, but right now, if you met a West Point graduate, you'd be impressed. People are well-educated and they have the right moral fiber they, they represent the country, they're trained to represent the, the country and they're you know, embarking on a great career. Uh, they, they, hold, they hold the elements of a great nation. And you know, it seems to me that, if, if, you know, that I would always encourage young people who could do it, who could somehow get through the, 
you know, the process and be appointed to West Point, I would always encourage them to take that job. It's really valuable. I mean, it's a personal experience. Um, is, is, am I right? Um, is, this, is this a really good career to follow now these days? I think it's a wonderful career. Obviously, obviously I chose it. But I, I would tell a young men that what 18-year-old knows what they want to do the rest of their life. But if, they, if they're interested and have the dedication to, to do it and the qualifications, then do it. And if it's not right for you, you'll know somewhere along the line. I mean, all the service academies, uh, the, the, the folks that leave after five or six years, the obligation, uh, there's a healthy percentage, but the, the country and the, the military understands that. So I, I agree with you. The education is top notch. I would put uh, service academy education against any college in, in the country. How about English Lit? Uh, I, when I went through, I, we had a set curriculum was mostly engineering. So when I went to, so when I went to, I had a chance, the, the army said, uh, we need to send you to graduate school. What would, what do you want to do? And uh, West Point had asked if I was interested, if I were to be interested to come and teach. And so I said, yes. And uh, literature I love, I love to read. And so I couldn't believe the army sent me to university to study literature, and then I taught it. And um, the Coast Guard paid my way through a graduate program at NYU Law School on, on taxation. And you know, you really have to stretch. Um, but I think there were a, a number of factors involved in that. They wanted me to stay in. Uh, <laughs> they wanted me to. <laughs> Here I am. Taking a very uh, what do you call it, obscure course in taxation, and the Coast Guard's <laughs> paying for it. Uh, this just shows you how much flexibility there is. There, there is. Suppose I can't get into a, a, an academy. Suppose I, 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 um, I just don't have the opportunity. Um, does your answer change? Does it change with OCS? Does it change with alternative programs? I, I learned the other day that uh, you can you can go to an academy. Uh, there are 82 chairs available at West Point for, for enlisted. You know, there's all kinds of programs out there that will get you to be an officer from surprise, surprise vectors. And I'm wondering, you know, what happens if I can't get into an academy for some reason uh, or I'm enlisted? Uh, you know, what, what are my chances then to have a, a really nice career? Um. I think very good. I mean, just for example, enlisted something, but when you and I were younger, they didn't have this. They have this, uh, the army does this uh, green to gold. We're promising uh, non-commissioned officers with uh, some courses they've been able to take on the side and so on and so forth. They will just send them on and put them laterally into an ROTC program and uh, allow them to study, get the degree and get their commission. And then there's the traditional officer candidate school you mentioned. ROTC is a wonderful source of, of uh, commissioning. And the services are great meritocracies. At least I, I feel they are. One, regardless of your background, where you got your commission, if you're an ensign on a ship, if you're in flight school or you're a lieutenant uh, in, in the Marine Corps, in the Army, you're all starting out equal. And people that are experienced will judge you. And if you're OCS, if you're West Point, ROTC, green to gold, then it will be on your merits. I agree. My experience is that too. If you work hard, um, do a good job, um, you're going to be promoted. You're going to be rewarded. Um, and uh, it's it's not sure there are, it's human, and there are people out there that are you know more egalitarian than others. There are people out there who are nicer than others, but the bottom line is, I always felt that it was fair, and there was, uh, you know, there were exceptions to the rule, but the the 99% was it was fair and it was a meritocracy in the purest sense. Um, sure, there's, there's a rub sometimes, but mostly you could count on it being fair. It was is that your experience? I, yes, it's been my experience, and and. We probably should touch on just the enlisted ranks for those that for a variety of reasons are interested or, or just their background doesn't suit them go to the officer route. 
Uh, I've seen so many young people, young men and women come into the army and find themselves and grow up to become staff sergeants as armed first class. And, and I, it's an amazing opportunity uh, because again, going back to this, uh, this idea of you, you rise on your merit. And I think young people sometimes feel, I, I can do this, I am somebody. And they find their niche in the services. Yeah, they find relationships they wouldn't find. Um, they find, as you say, talent within themselves they wouldn't, they wouldn't find. But you know, before we go, I, I want to examine one issue that's come up on the, in the national press uh, since uh, January 6th. And that is this, this um, I don't know, it's not really established yet. Uh, when Nancy Pelosi starts her um, board of inquiry in Congress and investigates further what happened on January 6th, this will probably get investigated. But th there, was, there was a certain amount of information feeding into the public conversation about how active duty or, um, I guess, retired military were among the insurgents, um, and for that matter, in the Trump base, uh, which was, you know, supremacist and the like. And you know, you hear that from time to time. Once in a while, a little scandal here and there, um, but it's never been so so concerning as it is now after January sixth. And I wonder if there's any any truth to it. I wonder what you, you know you think about a the existence of that that thread in the military and b um, whether uh, you know the, the senior management of the military is is tolerating it or uh, or is stopping it and what they're doing. I, I don't know if uh, you might answer my question, but I'm very curious about that. I, I well, let me do the second part first. Uh, the the senior the leaders the. Um, almost at all levels, even, even from company command, the captain or the full lieutenant on up, they know that, they know that we, we in the military serve the constitution. I mean, and all the manifestations, we talk about education at every level, I can speak of the army education system. We talk about that, the subordination, the military civilian authority, the, the, the pledge to support and defend the constitution. There's no confusion there. and There's no toleration in, in my, my time for anybody that took an aberrant view. Now, uh, would there be some folks in the, in the uh, broad, the, the military writ large that could have, uh, let me call it aberrant view. And uh, those people that, that stormed uh, the Capitol, uh, aberrant view is the kindest thing I can say. Uh, I, I can't dismiss that, but I, I would say that if it were organized or uh, any numbers, they would be be identified and ferreted out. There's no tolerate. There's no toleration. I'm very confident in the military today for that that attitude or that behavior or that this lack of support and disloyalty to the Constitution. I may be yeah. naive, but I, I'm pretty confident in what I say. Well, I you know it'd be really interesting to. Uh... You know, because obviously there are there are investigations going on these days. But one of the possible investigations is within the military itself. Uh, if I, for example, was a trial counsel or in a prosecutorial role in any service, and it came to my attention that uh, Joe Dokes was there, uh, or somehow supported that insurrection, I would take I would take action. I would uh, I would look for an administrative discharge at the least, and maybe much more than that. In order to make it clear, you know, there's so, there's so many reasons to do this to make it clear that we don't tolerate that. We can't have that here. This is a, a you know a nation of laws and so forth, and and the military represents the country. They are the country. You know, we are inextricably intertwined. I am so patriotic, um, but but I think it may it may fall on the military to clean its own house to the extent that it is revealed that there are individuals who were either on active duty or recently departed from active duty who were at the Capitol on January 6th. No, I, I think uh, that's exactly right. I, my guess would be that I, I know there's one case that, that, to your point, that got a lot of uh, reporting of, of a recently not separated, but uh, on essentially uh, separation leave, active duty captain. Um, my, my guess is they'll go back and, and look at that person's 
associations and, and probably ask what did you see any manifestations of this this attitude etc so forth you you've served in the military long enough to know that they will they will not stop with just reprimanding or punishing the people they identify the military will look into uh any possible uh, linkage uh, oh. in fact they'll be very thorough I'm, I'm very confident of that i'm i'm happy to hear that and i agree with that and i think that's entirely appropriate um it's very important that we have confidence in our government and that also means confidence in our military yeah so uh we're almost out of time general and i and i wonder if you could um you know sort of uh come to the takeaway here and um, you know, speak to whoever is watching and tell them what you would like to leave with them about our discussion, about your career, uh, about life in, in Hawaii uh, after retirement, about, about life in Hawaii looking west to Asia after retirement, uh, whatever comes to mind. I'd be interested in your takeaway on all this. I've, I've enjoyed the, the chance to chat. Uh, I think the yeah, your point was a good one about the members of the military community, people like me that are retired here, that we're we're members of the community, we try to help where we can, but by the same token, the active duty uh, members of the military, they're part of our community too. Uh, it's one thing that that uh, some of the four we go to, and certainly Mac and, and some of the other ones, is just try to say, recognize the military is part of the community, Yes, we have all the values you've talked about in your, your uh, preface remarks, but we also uh, want to be a part, we contribute, and uh, we can do the things um, that any good citizen, any member of the community is, or can do, I should say. So that was kind of a rambling, but you took all my good lines in the beginning. <laughs> I I, you know, I want to pull something out of that to say that, you know, one of the best things you can do in your life is have the opportunity um, to pay forward, to pay it forward, um, to make contributions to the community. And one of the things about a military career is it allows you the time in your life and the opportunity to do yeah. just that. And, and then when you get there and you make this contribution, and you and I have something in common in that regard, um, you make this contribution and wow, it is so gratifying. It, 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 it makes life really worth living. And I, and I sense that in you, and I want you to know I, 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 I believe in that for myself. Well, Jay, I, I appreciate it. it uh, you, you've obviously continued to contribute here and uh, way out of proportion to, to what we had reason to expect. Thank you. Lucky you live Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you, General. Lucky the two of us. Aloha. Aloha.